2013, the AFO-SR uh, Summer Faculty Fellowship in 2014, and the Young Investigator Award from the Office of Naval Research ONR in 2015. He is the author and co-author of 10 Friends Best Paper Awards at YOPT in 2009, ICIMP at 2010, IEEE WCNC at 2012, uh, IEEE PIMRC at 2015, IEEE Smart Gridcom at 2015, EU CNC in 2017, IEEE GOCOM in 2018, IFIP NTMS in 2019 and IEEE ICC in 2020 and again in GOPUM in 2020. He is the recipient of uh, 2015 Fred W. Ellersick Prize from the IEEE Communication Society of the 2017 IEEE Comsoc Best Young Professional in Academia Award. Of the 2018 IEEE Comsoc Radio Communications Committee Early Achievements Award and of the 2019 IEEE Communications uh, Comsoc Communication Theory Technical Committee. He was also a co author of the 2019 IEEE Communication Society Young Author Best Paper. He received the Dean's Award for Research Excellence in Har from Virginia Tech in 2019. He currently serves as an editor for the IEEE transactions on mobile computing and the IEEE transactions on cognitive communications and networking. He is an editor at large for the IEEE transactions on communications. So welcome, Professor. And uh, I would also, I mean, uh, 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 tell the students uh, and uh, other uh, uh, people who are present here today a little bit about the abstract of uh, Professor's talk. So the talk abstract is the following. Due to major communication privacy and scalability challenges stemming from the emergence of the large-scale Internet of Things services, machine learning is witnessing a major departure from traditional centralized cloud architectures towards a distributed machine learning paradigm, where data is dispersed and processed across multiple edge devices. A prime example of this emerging distributed machine learning paradigm is Google's renowned federated learning framework. Despite the tremendous recent interest in distributed machine learning, remarkably, prior work in this area remains largely focused on the development of distributed machine learning algorithms for uh, inference and classification tasks. In contrast, in this talk, we focus on two novel distributed machine learning perspectives. We first investigate how, when deployed over real world wireless networks, the performance of distributed machine learning, particularly federated learning, will be affected by inherent network properties such as bandwidth limitations and delay. We then make the case for the necessity of a novel joint learning and communication design perspective when deploying federated learning over practical wireless networks such as cellular systems. Then we turn our attention towards the design of new distributed machine learning algorithms that can be used for uh, generative tasks. In this context, we introduce the novel framework of brainstorming generative adversarial networks, BGANS, that constitutes one of the first implementations of distributed multi-agent GAN model. We show how BGAN allows multiple agents to gain information from one another without sharing their real data sets but by brainstorming their generated data samples. We then demonstrate the higher accuracy and scalability of BGAN compared to the state of the art. We also illustrate how BGAN can be used for analyzing a millimeter wave channel estimation problem in wireless networks that rely on unmanned aerial vehicles or UAVs. We conclude this talk with an overview on future outlook of the ex exciting area of distributed machine learning. So, Professor, I just, uh, I mean, finished the talking about the abstract, and now I give it over to you. Uh, so, I mean, uh, 
you may kindly i mean uh, start and uh, i mean uh, uh, yeah. let us know about your uh, good current work and everything so please yes. professor it is now over to you yes so can you see my slides can you see my slides Yes, yes, sir, sir. I can see you. Yes. So thank you so much for the invitation. Uh, so uh, uh, and for the nice introduction. So in today's talk, I'm gonna discuss uh, this uh, challenges of machine learning, particularly distributed machine learning when operating over wireless networks. Uh, so uh, I'll start with a brief introduction, as you can see the outline on the screen now. Uh, I'll talk about. I mean, the talk is divided into two portions. In the first portion, I'm gonna talk about. Uh, 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 basically, the marriage between uh, distributed learning and communication, and we're going to look at how you can start thinking about jointly designing machine learning algorithms and wireless networks. In the second part, I'm going to talk about a, a, a new uh, type of distributed learning algorithms uh, that leverages what is known as GANs or generative adversarial networks. Uh, I'm going to present our framework there and then discuss a small application related to UAV communication. So uh, what is the current state of, of uh, data analytics, let's say, particularly as it pertains to wireless networks? So we, we are currently witnessing a move from the classical centralized cloud big data norm towards a, a paradigm where you have a very large number of devices from smartphones to uh, tablets to virtual reality uh, apparatus uh, sensors that have small chunks of data but they, that still need to work together in order to perform a machine learning task. As opposed to classical IoT, where you have to send all the data to a cloud and the cloud performs the machine learning on your behalf. So the question that people ask was, can users collaboratively learn a task, a machine learning task, of course, of interest? And the first answer came through federated learning, I guess, four years ago now, uh, with, when Google talked about the possibility of mobile phones performing collaborative machine learning without sharing data, but by sharing only their model parameters. That allows you to, uh, to, allow, that allows you to do on-device data analytics, and that allows you to ma maintain some privacy for your, for your data. So the questions we tried to go from uh, uh, with federated learning were three of them. The first one, we started to say, in wireless communication systems, oftentimes we have to uh, uh, deal with uh, uh, with machine learning te uh, uh, techniques in order to do, for example, resource management, to learn the, the mobility of the user, the behavior of the user, and then do some optimization. So the first area you can work on here is federated learning or learning at the edge to perform communication. And that will not be, I mean, I will talk a little bit about it towards the end, but in the first part of my talk, I will focus on the second question. What if you have a, a federated learning algorithm that's doing some machine learning task? Think of a vehicular navigation task, some collaboration among users, like you see in the figure here. But this learning algorithm is using a wireless network like 4G, 5G, or 6G later on. So what happens to the performance of your learning if the wireless system itself is not uh, has you know, randomness uh, and, and, and has errors in the communication? So this is what we like to call communication for learning, and this one, learning to communicate. Finally, I'm going to talk a little bit more about this idea of generative models, and that, that will be more clear as I move forward. So what is federated learning? So in federated learning, uh, I can actually reuse this figure. You have uh, a sorry, number uh, of... Sir, uh, sorry, sorry for interruption, sir. Your slides are not uh, changing. So They're still not changing? Uh, uh, no, uh, sir. We are seeing the same first slide. I have changed significantly. Um, yeah, now it's changing. So now you can see. Yes, outline we are seeing now. Yeah, so let me, let me, I'm not gonna use the full screen. I'm gonna use this one, it's easier. Okay, uh, yes, yes. So, it's fine, uh, but, thank you, sir. Uh, let me try one more thing. Because I, I will need to have some animation in some of the slides. Uh, let me try something. What about now? Can you see, can you see them moving? Uh, still not, uh, yet not appeared. So uh, maybe uh, it will. 
Hello, so sorry for interrupting, but I think you have to share the entire screen in Google Meet. Oh, I see. Okay, let, let me do that then. Let, let me do that. I think it's better because then I can. Uh, yes. Sir. Uh, I can show the, the the full slide. Okay. Let me try now. So, do they move now? Yes, yes, sir, it's fine. So I was on this slide. Okay, okay, yeah. So I was trying to explain uh, uh, how federated learning works, right? So I was, I, when I said figure, I was referring to this figure here. So in this figure, you can see you have multiple users. Each user has its own local neural network along with the local data. And the, the, the users are essentially in federated learning. You have something called the, uh, the parameter server, or in a wireless network, it could be a base station. So these local data models are exchanged over the wireless links with the base station or the parameter server, which has a global model. The global model then uh, aggregates these weights, so the weights of your neural network, basically what are the weights of the neural network model of each user, WI, W1, W2, W3, and then sends back this G. And this is how federated learning is, tra is trained among these users. And in, uh, in the Google work and follow-ups as well, they showed that this uh, process can converge and the users can learn the task of interest. Mathematically, this is essentially uh, an uh, optimization problem where we're trying to minimize with respect to the weights uh, a loss function, f, that's function of your weights, function of the input-output data, uh, 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 the, the input data sample, the, um, the output data sample, and it's function of the number of samples and the number of users uh, uh, as well, and the total number of training samples. And at the end, when, once federated learning converges, we'd like to have everything, uh, all the weights converge to the same model, which means everybody learned uh, the same task, and they can now do inference. Now, and this just explains, I mean, this, this chart just explains what I, what I said verbally. The base station transmits the global FL model. Uh, then the users update the local FL data. Then they transmit the local model and then updates the global model, and then if it converges, no, they keep repeating this process. Uh, but in, in the existing learning algorithms, in the learning literature, they assume that these links are perfect. So you can send W1, it's received with perfect quality at the base station. There are no errors. In some works, they assume like there's a bandwidth constraint, and then they try to, to reduce the amount of uh, or the, the size of W, but they do not assume to have a fully fledged, if you wish, wireless network, so which has interference, fading, all these factors. However, if you think about it, if you have an actual wireless network, wireless transmission errors will impact the federated learning performance. And also the delay, the transmission delay, and the energy consumption must be considered. So when you're deploying federated learning over a wireless network, and you're exchanging these metal parameters, you should be able to optimize uplink, downlink, and over the different links, the performance of your wireless network so that to allow as little effects of the wireless parameters on the federated learning performance. So what we, dis what we wanted to, to ask, the question we asked in this work is, what is the impact of transmission errors and delay on the performance of federated learning, which can, can link together learning, which is a completely uh, uh, independent task being, being done by, by different devices, and wireless communication. So how do they come together? Why do we call this, I mean, you can see the title here, Joint Learning and Wireless Design. So again, this is, a, I mean, just a repetition here. This is if you do a centralized training, then everybody controls W, then you don't have a problem. But in distributed training, you have these exchange of data, which I already mentioned. You would do some sort of gradient descent uh, uh, to perform this training, and this gradient descent is subject to errors. So here you see G is an averaging of your weights, but these weights might have errors in them. And what are those errors? How do those errors affect your wireless performance is the question we're going to answer in this, uh, in this first part of the talk. So this is our system model. This is a transaction or wireless paper that appeared this year. So we have, again, this figure coming on. Uh, and again, you have one base station, your users doing FL. Uh, we look at uplink transmissions uh, for sending the parameter servers and downlink transmissions for sending the global model back. And in the uplink, your data rate, which we call CI uplink, is function of the resource blocks you have. So are you allocated resource? The power transmission power you have. It's the sum over every resource blocks you're allocated of the transmission of the bandwidth, 
And then the transmission power here, this is the channel rate, expectation with respect to the channel fading HI, and you have the bandwidth and you have interference from other cells. In the downlink, so this is uh, here. In the downlink, you have a similar expression as well. So you have the transmit power in the downlink, any possible interference, and you have the uh, bandwidth allocated to each, to each user. So the delays over uplink and downlink, over the uplink, we have the data size divided by the data rate. Over the downlink, we have the data size divided by the data rate. You can start to see here how wireless and learning start to come together. I have here a transmission delay, which is function of R and P, which are wireless parameters, but it's also function of WI, which is a weight coming from federated learning. You can see that now learning and communication are very much related. And uh, you can see the same as well uh, in the down. So if there are transmission errors, we assume that in the downlink, the, the, the channel is good because typically downlink you have, uh, uh, you have more resources and, 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 and better control. So we're gonna look focus primarily on the uplink transmission errors. So let's assume there's a packet error rate, QI, which is function of the resource blocks again and the, um, the transmit power, which is given by this packet error rate, which is a very standard expression uh, uh, for coded channel transmissions. It again gives you uh, uh, the bit error, rate, the packet error rate, percentage or, or fraction, if you wish, as function of uh, the power of transmission, uh, your interference levels, and the. Uh, Excuse me, sir. Uh, sorry for the interruption. Uh, sir, uh, would you like to take the questions in between or at the end of the talk? I am happy in both. So if you want to interrupt to ask questions, feel free to do so, and I can do it at the end as well. So, so we have uh, one question in the chat box. Uh, I am sure. uh, reading the question for. Uh, the person. Uh, so Anupam is saying that, asking that, uh, how to ensure in federated learning architecture that no client is sending any malicious local model to contaminate the global model? That's a great question. I think uh, there's no way to guarantee in the classical algorithm we use here. Uh, that is a security problem. I've seen some results in the literature where they look at this security like uh, uh, data poisoning attacks. In this, in this talk, I assume you don't have security, so every, everyone is, uh, is a legitimate user. But that's an open problem, and it's an important problem, but, but it's, not, it's not accounted for here. No, thank you, sir. So that's the only question until now. OK. We proceed here. Thank you. Yes. So this is the, uh, the packet error rate. Uh, so what we're going to say now if, is if your uh, uh, weights are received in error, with a certain threshold, let's say we set a threshold of error of 1% or 2% or whatever packet error rate we want, then we will discard the packets coming from that user, which gives me the global model as function of power and resource block. It's also an of uh, uh, user association, whether I select the user or not. And you can see the CW here. The CW says, if user I is discarded because of high packet error rate, then this will be zero. So this term will not appear. And then we don't select this user because then AI will be zero. Otherwise, uh, we will select the user and we will aggregate uh, its, uh, um, its weight. So now we can repose the, the federated learning question with wireless accounted for. So we're trying now to minimize with respect to A, P, and R. The same equation I had before, but now I have this global model that is function of A, P, and R. It's function of wireless parameters. This is subject to uh, AI and RI are binary variables, uh, feasibility constraint. And then you have the delay should be less than gamma T. The energy should be less than gamma E, and you should have at least, I mean, every user will have more than one, I mean, the number of resource blocks allocated should be uh, uh, fixed, and then the power, the max power, uh, which you have here. So now to solve this problem, the first question is to be able to uh, quantify this equation and to see what is the impact of wireless. So our main result in this paper, our main result is the following. We show that, and this is a, a, a proven theorem that, the convergence of federated learning is upper bounded by the following. It's upper bounded by uh, uh, this term and this term. Let me first uh, look at the second term. So if you don't have wireless parameters, this term here is zero. If you don't have wireless, this term goes away. You only have this term. A, this capital A, is a, is a number less than one. So if T goes to infinity and you only have this term, then federated learning converges. However, unfortunately, if you have this term that is coming from the wireless factors, you can see the packet error rate here uh, uh, appearing, which is function of RI and PI. Then if T goes to infinity, even though this term goes to zero, this term does not go to zero. So at the end, you might not converge because you have packet errors. And that's a very uh, meaningful and important result because it says that if you deploy FL over a wireless network, packet errors can hinder convergence. 
Now, going back to my optimization problem, now it's clear that if I want to ensure convergence, all I need to do is minimize this term. This term does not matter. I need to minimize this term so we can repose the optimization problem as a minimization of this set first term, and then we can find uh, 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 our, our training uh, strategy. So again, this is the total number of samples, samples per user, global model uh, at optimality. So G star is the global model at optimality. And this is a, it's just a constant. It doesn't have any physical meaning. Uh, but it is function of uh, of, of these, you know the uh, uh, the bracket error rate and some of the other factors. So this is a key characterization of a dated learning performance over wireless conversions is affected by wire packet error rate. We did use full gradient descent here, but we can extend these results uh, to stochastic gradient descent, and we did that in another world. Uh, so the, the main message here is the wireless network should be uh, reliable enough to support effective federated learning. Based on theorem one, I'm not gonna show the optimization results. They're very simple. It's just convex optimization. We can find the optimal power allocation, which is the uh, min between a, the Pmax and this value of Pi, which is the solution to this equation. This is very easy to find. It's a, uh, it's a very, very simple equality. And you can all then use the uh, Hungarian method, which is a very famous method to allocate the optimal resource box. But now I'm gonna try to change your view of learning. So when we think of learning before as wireless uh, community, we think of it as a tool to optimize wireless. Here I'm saying it's different. Here I'm saying wireless and learning are intertwined together. So think of them as a single system and you're trying to optimize together. And this is what we call a, a joint learning and communication. So some of our simulation parameters, so these are very standard. So we use one watts for the transmit power of the base station, 10 milliwatts for the devices, 100 millisecond target delay, uh, a, a, a few joules for, for, the, for the energy. And I'm gonna show the results based on different data sets. One is very simple, which is just a regression. I'm gonna talk about it first. Uh, and then I'm gonna compare with the baseline that optimizes user selection, but not resource allocation. And with baseline B, which is essentially the classical Google algorithm uh, that does not, uh, that randomly allocates everything, that does not look at wireless. So this is the, the regression example. It's a very simple one, just to show how things work. So you can see if you have a genie-aided design, the optimal solution is the pink. We're trying essentially here to estimate the line from the samples. The pink is the best fit that you can find if you have an optimal centralized solution. If you use our approach, you're very close. You're actually over, overlapping with the pink one. If you use Google's algorithm, it's quite different. The green one is very far away. If you optimize only user selection, you're also still far away. Now, next, we use the MNIST database. Uh, so we now use the MNIST database, these uh, digits that is very popular in, in the literature. And we look at the identification accuracy. We compare with the third baseline, which is not, not very interesting, actually. It's a very, uh, 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 very naive algorithm. So we can see here that the identification accuracy increases with the number of users, because now you have, have more diversity in the, in the users in the, in the network. And you can see that our approach is significantly better uh, uh, than all three baselines at all number of users. And now we see it with the number of resource blocks. We can see, again, we are better as you have more resource blocks. And there's a significant accuracy uh, improvement compared to the baseline B, which is Google's algorithm. And there's still a notable uh, performance uh, improvement compared to baseline A. And this is a, just an, another example. If for every uh, set of, of, of uh, 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 digits here, on top, you see what our algorithm detects. On bottom, you see what baseline B detects. Everything in red is a misdetection. So you can see in the first line, there's no difference between the two algorithms. In the second line, uh, uh, there's one error from Google. We have no errors. In the third line, there's three errors here. We only have two. In the fourth line, you can see there's three errors. We only have two. You can see clearly that not accounting for wireless errors is not sustainable because it can impact the accuracy uh, of your of your federated learning algorithm, and therefore it can impact your performance, and it can impact the uh, the quality of the inference you can do uh, after the training. So the main message here is joint learning and communication. Think about it as a single tool where you're trying to optimize accuracy and optimize wireless performance, making sure the uh, the relationship between the two uh, is taken into account and tweaked properly to make sure that you have high accuracy and you have a reliable network that supports that high. And you can think a lot of extensions to this work. We've done them already. Uh, one is we looked more at optimizing the convergence time. We looked also at the energy efficiency in more detail. We also looked at the case where you don't need this base station. You do only among devices. Uh, we looked at the idea of providing incentives to participate in federated learning. 
And we also looked at the first question I asked, which I did not talk about in this, uh, in this presentation, using federated learning for networks, uh, using federated learning for vehicular networks, for virtual reality networks, for drones and vehicles as well. So some remarks. So tomorrow's wireless networks may need to support, or when I say tomorrow, I mean 6G or even 5G, very sophisticated learning, FL learning tasks. So the question you should ask, we also, of course, should ask what can federated learning give us for 6G? And everybody asks that question. The question I wanted to ask here also is what can 6G do for federated learning? And we cannot give a full answer yet, but we can say we need reliability, low latency. Uh, we can say we need this joint design to improve accuracy and network performance. And uh, this is a very kind of rich area that many of you uh, as students can, can work on. Now I move to the next question. So when we talk about federated learning, I would say 90% of the literature uses what is called the inference model or discriminative models, which means the following. So in machine learning, there's two areas, one called the generative approach and one called the discriminative or inference approach. Usually you have X, which is an observable variable, and Y, which is the target variable. A discriminative model, the second bullet, which is what most federated learning has been doing, is a model of the conditional probability of y on an, uh, conditioned on an observation of x. So what is the possible label of you wash of y knowing that I observed x? A generative model is a statistical model that finds the joint distribution. It allows you to find the, uh, the, the joint distribution of x and y. So most existing federated learning algorithms have been on the discriminative side. But the generative models, I'm sure most of you know, they're very popular and very famous now, and I'll give you some examples of them. Back in the old days, the most famous was the Gaussian mixture model and the Bayesian networks. Recently, there has been also interest in something called the variation autoencoder, but more particularly, there's a lot of interest in what is called generative adversarial networks. And GANs were some of the tools used to create the deep fakes that I'm sure many of you are, are, are familiar with, where you can generate fake celebrity photos or fake data, and generative models allow you to learn the joint distribution, and then you can sample uh, uh, points out of that distribution. So why is it called GAN, Generative Adversarial Network? Because the, the architecture is the following. You have a generator neural network and a discriminator neural network. And there's a noise source, there's a distribution FG here and a distribution FD here. So what the generator does is it tries to generate an example from a distribution that is trying to learn. The discriminator tries to, to, to pick whether this is real or fake. And uh, this interaction is a zero-sum game. Uh, and that was modeled by, uh, uh, by Ian Goodfellow. So it's a zero-sum game where you generate a, a, a fake data and the discriminator tries to guess it. And it was shown that this game has a Nash equilibrium and it can be trained properly. And once the generator is trained properly, you can generate fake data or you actually learn the distribution. So now you can generate input data out of that distribution. But all the existing works on GAN are centralized. They assume you have a full server, has access to the input data, trying to learn that distribution and doing the generation. In the real world, as we said in IoT, for example, or in future 6G networks, the data is actually distributed among multiple agents. It could be private, you don't want to share it, or scarce, so I only have a partial data. So the question is, can we learn the distribution of the total data without sharing the private data by only sharing uh, something that's not private, and, by, uh, and then the question is, I mean, think about it this way, Go be, going back to the celebrity photo question. If I own uh, figures or photos of male celebrities and another device next to me owns photos of female celebrities, can we, without sharing the actual data, do a distributed GAN and learn the full distribution of uh, male and female celebrity photos? Uh, sir, uh, sorry for interrupting yeah, sir, a few more questions are there in the chat, sir. Can we take? Yes, go ahead. Okay, so uh, Mr. Shamoresh Bera is asking that, uh, uh, do we need to have the end users as time synchronized? If not, then how to update the global model? So they don't have to be synchronized in time. Uh, I think the way it works is there are versions of the related learning that are synchronous and asynchronous. In the asynchronous case, sometimes they just do the update with whatever information you got, and then you can, you can update again. Uh, also, keep in mind in federated learning, there's also local updates. I did not account for them in my model, but you can also. So you can do some local updates first and then transmit uh, a, a, a basically the outcome of that, which reduces the amount of transmissions and can help synchronize. 
On the other hand, if you're doing it in a, in a cellular network, cellular networks will allow you to allocate resource blocks, and that allows to somewhat have some synchronization in some sense. Okay, so uh, the next question is from Sricheta, and he, she's asking that how to deal with problems in federated learning like concept drift when the underlying data generation framework evolves over time or when the machine behaves differently at different times of day or week or month, say. Is there any optimization or kind of dynamic model for resolving those kinds of issues? Yeah, that's interesting. There have been uh, uh, some by our group, some by others, that look at personalized federated learning, meaning you can, you can adapt your models uh, uh, to your data. That is challenging, but that can be done. I, I don't have a direct uh, uh, example, but I have seen works on that, and I think that's an open area uh, with a lot of interest especially in wireless where your data can be changing and things of that sort. Okay, uh, that's all, okay. so you may proceed. Thank you. So the question is, can we do distributed GAN? Now, what is out there in the literature? We found out that in the literature, there's a few distributed GAN solutions. Uh, there's not a lot of them, uh, uh, but, but most are fit into these like two bins. One is a simple solution called federated learning GAN, where instead of having a, uh, a, a uh, a uh, discriminative model, you have actually a, a GAN at every agent, and you follow federated learning. You share the generated parameters, you share the discriminated parameters, and you do federated learning. The problem with this is not fully distributed, because you still need that parameter surface. Now, there are other solutions called multi-MD GAN and F2U GAN. In MD GAN, what happens is the discriminators share their data, and you, have a, you don't have a generator at the devices. You only have a generator at the central server, and then the discriminators share uh, their data with the central server. The central server also shares the generated uh, uh, information and sends it back. The problem with MDGAN and FTUGAN is, FTU -GAN is the same as MDGAN, but without the green, uh, without the discriminated coordination. The problem with these two is that they are still centralized as well, and they are actually, uh, they, they are significantly uh, large in overhead. So, unfortunately, the existing works are not fully distributed. They, are, uh, they have expensive communication requirements, particularly MDGAN and F2U, and they cannot allow the agents to have different neural networks. Why is that useful? Because in an IoT, for example, you have a, a sensor network that can run a very small uh, uh, neural network. You have a smartphone that can run a more complicated neural network. So you have heterogeneous devices. Unfortunately, FLGAN, MDGAN, and F2U cannot uh, allow you to have different neural network architectures. And the agents do not own their generators in MDGAN and F2U GAN, so you need to rely on a third server for that for generating the data. So the question was, can we create a fully distributed solution with heterogeneous agents having different neural networks, uh, and that could be better in, uh, uh, than this state of mind? The answer was yes. And what did we did is this brainstorming GAN, or what we call BGAN. So the idea is every agent has a discriminator and a generator, and it's private data set. What we do is we don't share model parameters and we don't share the real data. What we share is the output of the generator, which is essentially a, a, the fake data. Think about it, this is the fake data. Now, this is not extremely private. I mean, you can still, from the fake data, you can perhaps guess uh, some part of the, of the local data, but it is more private than sharing the raw data. And as we can see, see later, it's much better in terms of performance than all of the other uh, uh, state of art. So the idea is brainstorming because when you share the generated the fake data, it's like when we share ideas. When I share an idea with you, I don't share the actual model of my brain. I share a representation of what I'm thinking. I cannot share the raw data. So that's essentially why we call it brainstorming. We share like a representation, a fake representation, but a faithful one of what is the generator is, uh, is doing. So with this architecture, we want to revisit now some of the results. So the benefit is going to be fully distributed, no central controller. Uh, the load is going to be better than most of the state of art. I'll show you later why. Uh, and we're going to have different neural networks if we wish. So the theoretical formulation, in a classical GAN, you have uh, this value function where you have the discriminator and the generator. One of them, let me show uh, uh, this. So usually the generator is trying to minimize this value function, discriminator trying to maximize it. And Ian Goodfellow shows for the single GAN, the centralized GAN, you have a Nash equilibrium of this scheme. What we did is the same now, but we have multiple. So now you, you are dependent on the generator of your neighbors, which in this paper we assume to be a, um, a mixture, a, a weighted mixture of the data, this PBI, 
This is coming from the GJ, and it's a mixture of the data of other users. And because it's interdependent, this is again theoretic setting. So we look at the argmin argmax of V. We're trying to find the discriminator generator that does the min max of this utility. Uh, so we have still a zero sum game, but we have multiple players. So is there a Nash equilibrium? We prove that there is. Uh, to, to prove that first, we find the optimal discriminator, which is essentially a ratio of this mixture of the data uh, divided by the mixture of the data plus your own uh, 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 data distribution, essentially. And then we have, uh, 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 we can find now a PGI star. So the game has a unique Nash equilibrium where PGI star is given by this summation. P data J means the probability that a point X belongs to the data of user J. N is the set of neighbors. Lij is an, in, or lambda, sorry, lambda ij is an interesting parameter that depends on how the agents are connected. So you can find it from an equation. I don't have it on the slides. We have it on the paper. And this depends on the structure. Is agent one connected to agent two to agent three? How, is it, how are they connected? Depending on the connection, you get different lambda uh, values here. So now what we know is uh, began works. Uh, you have a Nash equilibrium. And, and, and it works. Now the interesting part is to seeing how it works in, a, in an experimental setting. So going back to my original question, if I own part of the data, you own part of the data, can we generate the full data set? So this is the simulation setup we use. Uh, unless I state otherwise, I'm going to use the string topology, where every neighbor is connected to the neighbor next to it. And this is called a strongly connected uh, graph because every, every node can reach the other node through a path. And I'm going to use different data set. One of them is this one, which is very simple to explain things. It's a ring data set. So the reason I use it is for some examples, it's very nice because we can say, what if I own half of the ring and you own half of the ring? Can I generate a full circle? And can you generate a full circle? And we're going to see the answer is yes. And we're going to use other databases as well, uh, uh, data sets, and I'm going to explain them as we go through. So first, we, we use what is called the Jensen-Shannon divergence which tells me how far is my uh, uh, data from, from the real data. So we can, we're trying to, to kind of see the quality, the performance of the algorithm versus the number of agents, the number of data samples. You can see that if you have one agent that owns a thousand data samples, that's the best you can do usually because he has so many uh, 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 samples. Now, what happens if you have one agent that owns only 10 samples, the performance is really poor. How do you improve that? Let's have more agents. The more agents you have, now, with BGAN, you can do a better GST. So, for example, compare this here. If you have a single GAN who has only 10 samples, his GST is 24. If we allow him to co collaborate with 10 others, he will reduce his GST by half. And that's really good because that improves the performance. This means that, of course, if you have a single centralized GAN that owns all the samples, that is the optimal, the best thing you can do. But if you have a single GAN that only owns partial data, Doing began allows you to do much better than only relying on your own samples. And here we show uh, a, a number of data samples per agent for standalone, which is a centralized GAN, began with five agents, began with 10 agents. A standalone that has only 10 samples can generate nothing, essentially. Began with five can do a little bit better, but still not great. Began with 10, a little bit better, not great. 50, uh, 50 samples. Began can already generate your, uh, your ring. A single agent alone, not that well. And then you can see as this improves up and up, of course, the standalone agent can do the best circle he can. Uh, and then we have began as well doing as good as, as it should. Now let's compare the JSD versus the number of samples and the number of neighbors. The more neighbors you have, the better you are. The more sample you have, the less need you have for began. Again, going back to my point, to my earlier point, if I'm an agent that owns a lot of samples, I don't need to collaborate. But if I'm an agent that owns very small samples, then the collaboration has a lot of benefit. And here we show a, uh, a number of agents with different neural networks. So agent five has 100,000 parameters, agent four has 30,000 parameters, agent three has 9,000, agent two has 2,000, agent one has 700 only. Here, if you wanna run MDGAN, FLGAN, and F2GAN, you cannot, it just doesn't work. You can see that BGAN works as good as the standalone agent in this case. And notice even in this case, that an, an agent with a very small neural network cannot do very well uh, and it's uh, 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 alone. So let's compare now to FL. Let's now look at this partial data. So 
what if I own partial data? What if I own half circle? He owns half circle. With began, you can see we can generate full circles, both agents. Now let's use a more complicated data set, this MNIST data set. And let's use a graph where you're connected to more than one neighbor. So look at this. You have agent who owns digit zero. He's generating digits three, seven, eight, and one. Agent who owns digit nine, he's generating zero, three, one, uh, two. Agent who owns digit seven, he can generate eight now. He can generate nine as well. So you can see now I'm learning from others without sharing. I mean, I'm sharing the fake data, but I'm learning and I can kind of uh, figure out the entire uh, distribution. Now, next, another type of data set. This is known the CIFAR-10. We can again see the same thing here. An agent who owns automobiles is able to generate uh, uh, pictures of birds. Uh, you can see a bird here. Uh, the agent who owns dog images, he also can generate pictures of birds. He can generate frogs as well. The, the agent who owns frog images, he can generate horses. Uh, the agent who owns ships, he can generate airplanes. So you can see we are able to, to basically have non-overlapping data, but learn the entire distribution. And now comparing with FLGAN, MDGAN, and F2U. So the JSD of BGAN is much better. This is the green curve. We're much, much better than them. And we're not that far with a standalone agent, which is, again, something you cannot beat. Uh, if you have a standalone agent, that's the best you can do. And we also compare something called the FID, which is uh, uh, another uh, score uh, to compare accuracy. You can see a BGAN converges very smoothly, and it's much better than F2U, FLGAN, and uh, uh, MDGAN. So you can see clearly we have a significant advantage. Remember that we're fully distributed. We allow you to have different neural networks. So we're, we have significant advantages across the board. And then in terms of communication overhead, so you have n number of agents, b the batch size. Uh, uh, this is the data size x and the size of the neural network. BGAN compared to MDGAN is much better because MDGAN depends on the batch and the input data size as well as theta d. We don't depend on theta d. Same compared to F2U. Now, compared to FLGAN, depends. If you have a neural network that is smaller than the input data size, then your uh, uh, FLGAN is better in terms of communication overhead. Otherwise, BGAN is better. So that depends on, uh, on the situation. So finally, we showed that distributed GAN models can be devised with no centralized control. And the question, what can we do with this next? There's a lot of things. Uh, if you are interested in security and privacy, there's a lot of questions there uh, to look at. If you're interested in doing inference, you can use BGAN to do inference. But also, we can look at more sophisticated networks, and we can also apply it to wireless. So we can apply it to security in IoT. You can see a paper of ours in Globecom 2019. But we can also apply it to wireless. And I'm going to give an example, uh, which is the last part of my, of my talk. This will be shorter, uh, but just to show you how BGAN can be applied to a channel modeling problem in UAVs. So if you consider a UAV network, Right, so I don't have the figure here, but I'll explain it uh, briefly. If you have a number of UAVs trying to communicate to the ground over what we call millimeter wave networks, which is high frequency bands. So every UAV is like a base station communicating with ground users. And the UAVs need to do millimeter wave communication. You need to do channel estimation. You need to learn the channel. And the channel depends on the location and on space and on time. At given time, a different space, you might get a uh, uh, given time, different location, you might get different channels. So what we do here is that the UAVs, each UAV can know the information about its own channel, but it doesn't know the information of another location and another time. And the UAVs can move. So they are interested in learning the entire, what I call the spatial temporal map of your wireless channel. And we assume that they can communicate over the air, air to air links are stable. And we apply BGAN to them. So every user now or every UAV has a BGAN uh, generator discriminator. And they're going to share generated samples of the data, uh, of the channels, essentially. And then they're going to together learn the spatial temporal uh, uh, model of, of the network. So now we have a UAV network structure, which is a graph with, uh, 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 with uh, vertices I, edges E. I is a set of UAVs. I have I UAVs as well. And each edge is an air to air communication link. And the UAVs are going to share eta SI generated samples. Now, first we prove. What is the probability that the learning converges after iteration t? And this looks complicated, but it's not. I'm going to explain it a little bit more. So this depends on the training error of the local GAN. It depends on this L max, which is the maximum shortest path. And this is important because you can see the probability of converging increases depending on the difference between the iteration you want and L max. 
So if you minimize L max, you can have a faster convergence in some sense. And L max is the maximum shortest pass in your graph. And it also depends on a couple of, of, of metrics. One is the number of in-degree UAVs, and uh, one is this shortest loop inside your, uh, uh, your graph. And finally, there's acceleration coefficients, which are the coefficients uh, we find in the derivation. So now I know what is the probability that learning converges. I can now minimize the convergence time. So you can see how began allows you to have a rich problem here, which is related more to, to wireless. So now we can choose this problem. We want to minimize the convergence time defined here as the time to uh, transmit the data, the time to perform local iteration multiplied by the uh, minimum uh, uh, iteration time, subject to UAV transmit power, to an SIR uh, target quality of, of service that I want, to a transmission time threshold, and we want the, the network to be strongly collected, connected, and no interference. Unfortunately, if you want to solve this, you need to do it in a centralized way. So we showed that you actually can do better. You can relax the optimization problem. You can relax this uh, constraint from an uh, inequality here to an equality. So the number of edges equals to the number of UAVs. And then you can propose a distributed solution that solves this problem. So I'm trying to find the optimal graph that minimizes the, uh, 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 the convergence time. And then we can show this distributed solution can also uh, uh, be extended even if this is not relaxed. So I'm not gonna go through this derivation here. So the main message here is you use BGAN on your AVs, but you need to optimize the convergence time by choosing the best graph structure among the AVs. Now we can show some simulation results. So number of UAVs versus the average JSD, you can see the proposed uh, 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 distributed GAN is much better than FL GAN, much better than MD GAN, and much better than uh, local GAN, which is essentially not doing collaboration. We also has, have less communication overhead compared to FL GAN and MD, uh, MD GAN. And you can see a larger networks lead to worse performance. That makes sense. You're more kind of, uh, 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 more worse performance for local CGAN uh, because you, I mean, you're, you're having more interference, you're having more users, and you're not doing much with it. For our approach, that's still as good. So you're still as good when you do a, a, a big N, which is the blue curve here. And here we show I is the number of uh, UAVs, B is the number of, uh, of channels, of resource blocks. And then you can see the probability of convergence. If you have uh, a, 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 a larger number of resources, you can converge faster. If you have le less resources, you need more time to converge. If you have larger network, you can converge. Uh, smaller networks, you converge faster. Larger networks, you need more time. Uh, to converge. And this is a paper available on archive as well. So now I can conclude just an overview on our research area, and I'll take any additional questions at the end. Uh, so uh, we're looking a lot at 5G, 6G, and everything there from low latency to machine learning, terahertz communication, reconfigurable surfaces, uh, human users in the loop. So there's a lot of activity we're doing here. Wireless extended reality, doing a lot of work on user experience, wireless optimization, uh, uh, holography. We have quite a bit of work on uh, connected drones and, and vehicles as well. We're looking at machine learning, distributed machine learning, uh, training free machine learning, and this is a main thread in our uh, research. We're also looking at latency and age of information in wireless networks. My group is also diverse, so we do things outside wireless. We've done some work on smart grids. We've done some works on smart cities as well, doing air pollution monitoring, things of that sort, security as well. Uh, and I do a lot of game theory. That's kind of our original type of, uh, of research. And I have some people looking at quantum communication and some other uh, topics like blockchain. Finally, uh, distributed learning is an exciting area, especially when you look at it with wireless. It's not just federated learning. Keep in mind that there's this big end, but there's also other ways, other ideas you can come up with here. Uh, there's many applications from networking to security and others. And this idea of multi-agent systems are important now in wireless, and you need to have multi-agent learning. And finally, I think there would be hopefully collaborations with many at IIT. Uh, and uh, with this, I conclude my talk, and I'm happy to take additional questions. Sir, I'm Rajushi Roy talking. Uh, my first question is this idea of brainstorming Yes. Is it somehow rooted in that actor critic model? Is it a uh, uh, network version like multi the like actor critic is like the two agents, but or maybe more, but yeah, it's like a mesh network version of that. 
It's, it's not, it's, I mean, I think GAN itself is a little bit similar in the sense you have a discriminator generator. Uh, and then you have like, you know, yes. there you have the active critic. But I think it's, it's, it's very different because active critic is typically done in reinforcement learning type of approaches. Uh, this one is a generative model that actually learns the distribution. Now, the brainstorming right. aspect is actually very different. The brainstorming aspect is the way to allow multiple of those. Think of it as multiple active critic trying to kind of come up with a, with a, with a common distribution. So yes, I can see yes, the multiple, but different. Yeah. Okay. And uh, I have uh, a few other questions. One is, let's say, <coughs> here we have this wireless environment. Therefore, we can expect certain type of errors. I mean, like quantization error. Yeah. Uh, then errors due to channel model. I mean, the channel uh, going bad. So, and sometimes the channel may not be available. So, basically, at every iteration of this uh, learning algorithm, what we have is some kind of a mapping. Now, because of these errors, what we are, we are going to see is some kind of inexact mapping. Yeah. So, therefore, the convergence may not take place. It Convergence will take place, but it may not take place where it was intended to. With an error in an error free situation. Yeah. So there will be a gap. Now, this gap, if we call it regret, I mean, how robust these algorithms are so that this regret can be, I mean, kept within certain bounds? This is, this is a fantastic question because this is the, the motivation of the paper we did the first uh, work. So, what we showed is yes, there is a gap. And we found it in, this, in our model. You can, you can extend it to others. I'll, I'll show it here. What we showed is there is a gap here, this one. This is exactly the gap uh, for this specific model. But if you run other algorithms, I mean, this is called federated averaging. You can use others, you can find other gaps. So this gap, what we, the best we can do is quantify the gap and try to tweak the knobs we can control. So we try to work on the resource allocation and the power control. So I think that's the best right. you can do is to minimize that gap. Uh, and then that's the best performance you can achieve. So you might not converge to a zero and actually, Based on experiments, sometimes even traditional FL does not go to, to a kind of perfect convergence. But still, the, the best you can do is to, to minimize that gap. Uh, there are strategies you can do here. We did it through optimization. Uh, some works did it through doing quantization. So they make uh, so the data you transmit becomes a little bit more robust than, than what we did here. So there's all sorts of questions. And I think this is, the, this is really my main message is uh, when you run these algorithms, there's a lot of them. Put them on wireless, you have a lot of important questions to ask about the errors and how they can affect you. This is one way to look at it, but there are others. Uh, and, and, and again, this gap is for fully gradient descent with the specific federated averaging. If you use others, there are recent algorithms, you get other gaps, and then you can quantify and you can in instill robustness uh, in, in your algorithm. Okay. Mm -hmm. So the students, uh, please go ahead uh, if you have questions. Uh, yes, sir. There are questions in the chat box. Uh, so let me take uh, one by one of, uh, of them. So uh, Mr. Kiran Prohit uh, was asking that how to deal with backdoor attacks in federated learn. Uh, yeah. So uh, I. I I'm not sure yet what the uh, this type of, Yeah, so what I want to say is that uh, this type of security problems are not really in my expertise. I have seen some solutions, uh, uh, but I, I'm, I cannot comment too much on that. Okay, okay, sir. So let's uh, move on to the next one. So, uh, Mr. Shormish Tanak was asking that, what is the simulation platform for working with federated learning or distributed learning? Okay, there are different ways. Uh, for example, in this, uh, the model I have on the, on, the, on, the, on the slides now, because it was a simple model and its really focus war was on the communication side, we could do it with MATLAB. And it, it was sufficient. The other work, the BGAN, we had to use Python uh, and TensorFlow FL and some of those uh, uh, tools that are more, uh, more complex but more suitable for that. So it depends on what you want to do. Uh, when it's a little bit like in this work, it's a little bit analytical. Uh, we can, I mean, we can validate in a MATLAB or something like this, but when you have more experiments, you need TensorFlow FL or at least some Python. 
Okay. So uh, moving on to the next one, uh, Mr. Anupam uh, was asking that training locally, the global model downloaded locally is not learning anything more than what it should learn. Like it's not learning any private aspect of the clients and transferring the knowledge to its neighbor. That, that is that is a great question. I think uh, in the this vanilla classical FL, you cannot ensure that there has been some solutions to 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 append some sort of privacy guarantees further on the transmission uh, using differential privacy in some of those uh, techniques. I think it's a it's, it's a great question. I, what I want to say is. Uh, uh, when I talk about began, some people say it's not very private. And I would say federated learning is not very private, actually, also. Uh, so uh, in the machine learning community, they claim it's privacy preserving. But if you talk to the expert in privacy, they say it's not because exactly of the problem you mentioned. So there has been some work in the privacy community that took that and tried to add to it some sort of differential privacy and other, other mechanisms. <laughs> Okay, so moving on to the next one. Uh, so Mr. Obishek Bera is asking that, uh, how does each UAV going to process the data or run the GAN model considering limited energy and resources of the UAVs? Is there any special framework for UAV? Uh, so for now we use that and I would say I agree that it might be energy inefficient because the, the drone has limited uh, power. We can still argue, okay, some of the recent, uh, like. Uh, a recent generation of drones can have more capabilities, so they can run again. Uh, but I would say that because we do this began training kind of once, uh, and, and later on you don't need to repeat the entire training, that can help alleviate energy efficiency. Uh, but I would say designing neural network models for GAN that are energy efficient, particularly for the generator, is an important research question uh, uh, that can be on top of our algorithm now. So I would say ours is not particularly energy efficient at this point. Uh, you can have an energy constraint or something like this, uh, but we need to go beyond that. Okay, so moving on to the next one. Uh, so I can't see any more questions in the chat box. So I request all the participants that if anyone is having more questions, uh, you can unmute yourself and directly ask uh, uh, our speaker uh, whatever doubts you have. So we are not uh, getting any further questions. Okay. Yeah. So one question uh, in the chat box that how do you, uh, Mr. So, so it, it goes like, uh, how do you evaluate the performance of the proposed approach? Uh, yeah, so, yeah, so it depends on different things. Uh, for example, here, what we do, uh, let me try to move the slides a little bit. So here we use the, the identification accuracy. So how accurately are you identifying a, um, uh, a digit. So you have a training set and a test set. You train on the training set and then try to identify the digits. Uh, in, uh, uh, in in vegan, we uh, we used also these metrics. Uh, this uh, show it here. The, the, the JST, which is the Jensen Channel Divergence, it gives you a uh, the 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 distance between two distributions. Uh, one is the real distribution and one is the one we learned. And so we try to see how close uh, 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 these two are. That's one way to look at it. So there are different metrics. For wireless, we use data rate and uh, delay and things like that. Okay. So thank you for from Baidehi. It was the question of her. So I can't see any more question in the chat box. So I request all the participants that if anyone is having any question, you can directly unmute yourself and ask our speaker. There is a question from uh, Kiran Prohit and Luke uh, Lahad. Yes, yes, this just appeared. So, uh, so Kiran Prohit was asking that what was the training time? Uh, actually, I I do not have the numbers. Uh, we did not. Uh, we did not track the training time, but uh, uh, we 
And that's for the federated learning. For this one, we have the training plan. I can show it here. Uh, for VBAN, we had we have it's here. So you can see the training epoch. It took about 0.5 to 10, uh, even less actually, 0.25, 10 to the power four epochs. Now I don't. I mean, how you convert that to time depending on the hardware, uh, but but it's kind of around around here. Uh, for federated learning, I don't have them in the slide. I, I, I don't remember the exact time, but we were not minimizing time. We have an extended work where we minimize the convergence time. Uh, okay, so I guess that uh, answers the question. So the next question from Mr. Mayuk Laha is that, so any work on RL or uh, multi-agent multi -agent RL? Yes, we have a lot of work on RL. That was, I was trying to decide which one to, to present today. Uh, we have many, many works on RL. Uh, I would, uh, uh, we, you can go to our website. We've done a lot of, I mean, we've invent, we, we've had our own RL algorithms. Recently, we looked at how do you do RL in a low latency environment? How do you do meta RL for, uh, for drone optimization? If you wish, after the talk, send me an email. I can send you a list of some of our works there. But I did not talk about them today because I did not have the time. Okay. So I hope that answers the question. So any other question is there? Uh, I can't see any more questions, but uh, let's wait. If anyone wants to ask any question, uh, can, uh, because we have a uh, few times in hand. Uh, there used to be uh, a few results a uh, few years back. It's like if you are running some kind of a distributed algorithm on top of, uh, I mean, uh, uh, wireless uh, uh, network connected entities, then if there is some kind of a favorable mobility, uh, which ensures that their paths are such that uh, they interact more often, then the oh, convergence yeah. speed of the thing improves. So this yeah. type of certain results were there from Dimakis and a few other people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I uh, is there any such thing that is going to uh, help there as well? Yeah, you can, I, I, I've seen a little bit on that. Uh, uh, we, we've done something small on mobility, but it doesn't show the, the, the benefits. Uh, but I think to consider, I don't consider it here. We considered it in extension but uh, but we did not look at a favorable side we, we, we more looked at how to adapt to mobility as you can see I think something like this can happen here especially what uh, we recently uh, proposed a case where uh, where federated learning is fully mobile so uh, you don't need a, a central server in that case it looks a little bit like some of those results I think here we call it collaborative uh, uh, collaborative federated learning so in that case yes mobility can help you uh, as you meet more users and as you exchange uh, 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 the parameters. I think some of those results might be revisited in, in the context of the I see. Uh, so, uh, so one of uh, our attendees from YouTube, uh, like, uh, the co uh, is asking. The question goes like: uh, In what form the incentives are provided in the federated learning architecture? Like, is it mandatory from or? So is, a, it's a man, is it a mandatory form or models with different levels of performance or any other form? Yeah, so I think that's a, and we looked at it and I think I, I, I'm pointing at the, at the paper here. So you can design incentives, for example, depending on how much energy you're willing to share. For example, the network can reward you with more, uh, uh, with more uh, access to the network. There could be some sort of even monetary uh, actual monetary incentives. So this is an incentive design problem that comes back to to, uh, to classical communication networks where you can give incentives to users to participate. How to design those incentives is a research question. We look at it. We looked at it before uh, from an energy and 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 and, uh, and um, contribution perspective. Uh, it could be kind of some some of the crowdsourcing results can be useful perhaps as well uh, in 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 designing those incentives. Uh, but that, with that said, I would say that if it's a cellular network, um, they might be able to enforce more or less because cellular networks all owns the resources. But again, I'm not I'm not supposed to share my my smartphone with others, so, so th there should be some incentive. 
okay so i hope there that were some work uh, where uh, it was the like the this kind of incentive so uh, uh, i mean uh, the the issue was that uh, what if everybody is not initially uh, cooperative in exchanging okay. data or helping yeah. others to learn things etc but yeah. if there are a few just a few uh, good guys at the beginning and then this incentive mechanism is there then sort of this goodness tends to propagate True. and eventually everybody tends to i mean there used to be somewhat like that also i mean uh, so maybe that yeah. can i mean uh, ah, come yeah, here too yeah they can these are very classical game theory problems which we've looked at for a long time in different domains uh, like uh, uh, like spectrum allocation uh, 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 so so yeah there are a lot of tools to do there for example uh, uh, you can use there's a, uh, this actually nobel prize winning framework called contract theory where you can design contracts i mean these contracts here can be i mean uh, virtual contracts they are not signed contracts to incentivize and ensure that everyone accepts at least one of those contracts and you can formulate that as an optimization problem and see i mean sometimes it's feasible others it's not but you can also see how many users you need and things like this these are interesting questions and they can co come on top of this yeah thank you so i don't uh, see any more questions in the chat box so one question from my side i would like to ask that sir in the federated learning why you are while you are collecting the data from the distributed nodes so how you are categorizing the similarities or dissimilarities of the functions before uh, aggregating those uh, models uh, to the central server so i mean we are in ways but this is federated averaging they don't they don't really quantify the similarity in some sense because that is already embedded in the weight the, the model the the the, uh, the model parameters of your neural network weight will already capture how this one is different from the other and then they they show that you can do simple averaging and that still works there has been extensions where they added other things to 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 the, to the way they do the aggregate model but still this aggregation seems to work even if they're different okay okay understood so thank you very much sir i don't uh, see any more questions and we are also on time now so uh, so it's uh, it's a pleasure to have you amongst us uh, and uh, thank you very much uh, Dr. rajeshwari sir uh, our uh, chapter advisor for uh, nicely uh, conducting and uh, proctoring the session. So before we end, uh, we have a small uh, virtual token of appreciation for uh, you, sir. So sir, can you uh, just kindly stop uh, presenting the screen so that we can share that? Just give me one second so that I, I stop this. Okay. Yes. Is, I think it's gone. I'm just presenting. Uh, uh, the virtual token of appreciation from our computer society. Uh, you got to make it look bigger yeah yes thank you so uh, this is the uh, our small token of gratitude uh, to you sir for uh, this uh, time from your busy schedule and obviously uh, like you'll be receiving one uh, uh, memento uh, from our section on behalf of IEEE computer society student branch chapter uh, so that will be uh, delivered to you by post. So uh, this is uh, the thing from our side. So thank you very much uh, for uh, joining us today. And before we end, finally, we'd like to take one uh, uh, group photo yes. with all the volunteers uh, uh, and our chapter advisor and all the participants, whoever wants to you know, open the camera and be in the frame with uh, Walitsa because it's a great opportunity to have sir amongst us and very uh, it's a like it's a uh, like the privilege to uh, have you sir amongst us so thank you very much so our uh, assistant secretary shourab will uh, take the snap 
so please uh, whoever wants to join in the frame uh, kindly uh, open your camera and uh, be there so shoda please uh, make sure that when you are taking the snap you just uh, uh, update us yeah please uh, be ready i am taking this snap thank you okay. thank you uh, thank you very much sir thank you, thank you so much so uh, sir rajuri sir do you want to say anything or should we conclude you, you are muted yeah, yeah you can conclude you can conclude yeah yeah uh. yes sir so sir should we conclude or you want to add something Uh, well, uh, it was a fantastic talk, and uh, we are really happy. And uh, I mean, I think our students will get great benefits uh, from you, this, and uh, that's the thing we want: that the students gets illuminated by various ideas, which are current and hot ideas, new ideas, and that way it was a very, very uh, I mean, good experience. and uh, i am sure students will get greatly benefited out of this and i would like to thank professor uh, walid sad for i mean offering us his uh, valuable time and no all the insights he has about various issues various emerging and complicated issues about various uh, things and uh, he has shared uh, his uh, I mean, insight with us and that's that's really uh, very very uh, important and we are really grateful to him I mean, for this, and Thank you, so much. Uh, you can see that very good work is going on in Virginia Tech, and uh, it's a very good school, and uh, we are really proud to have you over here tonight. And uh, on a personal note, I would say that this convey my personal greetings to Professor U. A. Thomas Howe of Virginia Tech. He was my laboratory senior in Polytechnic Brooklyn, where I did the PhD. We had the same advisor, so oh, please convey my personal greetings to him. Oh, I will. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Sir. Thank you very much, sir. And I hope that, uh, like, we'll have you, sir, uh, next this time physically in our campus at yes, Karakpur once again. Yes, uh, uh, so we are extremely eagerly waiting for that moment. So I hope we soon will have you physically in our campus. So yeah, I hope so too. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Thank you. Bye. Yes.